It's important to share struggles and, and things that you've gone through in life. That doesn't have to define you. That's not the definition of who you are. It's never too late to start a new chapter. This is Jen Lilly in Making a Portrait. My family is very smart, very funny, very, um, they're awesome. Yeah, they're all like wildly smart. Um, they're wickedly witty. I mean, they're just fast. Like, I remember always sitting around the dinner table and being like five jokes behind and they'd be like, what? And I was like, cause of banana. And I would like, -da 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 -da, and I'd come up with my zinger and they were like, what? And I was like, cause you know, like, and they were like, that was like five jokes ago, keep up. So. <laughs> High school Jen was a very mature, sweeter girl than I maybe am now. <laughs> like I feel like sometimes I'm aging backwards. She was very responsible, but also a pushover. I took loving people and kindness almost at my own expense, which I think is sometimes right. I think it's always good to take the high road, but I also think that, you know, um, being attacked for thing, I think it's okay to have a voice and to stand up for yourself. So. So Jen was a little bit of a doormat in high school. Um, my nickname in high school was Jen for Jesus. So I was, um, and I'm still like a huge Christian, but um, Jen for Jesus in high school was very interesting. I was kind to everybody, but I was, if you were not popular, you thought I was popular. And if you were very popular, you thought I was not popular. So it was kind of the kid like in the middle that was just kind of friends with everybody. And I, I try to be that person. You know, I try to just, I don't care if you don't believe what I believe. I always want people to just feel like loved when they're around me. So I was actually bulimic for 15 years, which was really, um, it's interesting because I grew up pretty much as a Christian. Like I remember I really fell in love with Jesus at age nine. So it wasn't like, I didn't know that I had worth. It wasn't like I didn't know that I was not created on purpose and for a purpose. But at the same time, you know, I can't even imagine what it's like to be a girl these days with social media, because it wasn't around, you know, when I was 15. But I think the pressure of, because I have a perfectionist um, personality and I grew up in the South um, where it was like, I was a member of the Clean Plate Club, you know, and just felt like the expectations of beauty that you still had from magazines and celebrities and all of that, um, led me to eating disorders because I loved food. And so when I discovered that I was able to throw up, I started that pattern. Psychologists and psychiatrists will say that a, a bulimia is very similar to an opioid addiction in your brain. It releases the exact same chemicals. So you kind of start on this high, but just like with an opioid addiction, there's like a high and then the next time the threshold's like here. So it's just like a really hard cycle to break out of. But one thing that my pastor said one day, and I was like, it was kind of the ticket for me. The best definition he could think of for sin was trusting anything more than you trust God. And I was like, wow, that's a really profound definition because what I'm actually doing is I'm trusting that my bulimia will keep me thin and keeping me thin will book me the acting job. So I love that I struggled with that for so long and that I broke free because I would have been the first person to say like, I'm just gonna struggle with this for the rest of my life. I know it's wrong, I don't wanna struggle with it, but it is what it is. It's important to share struggles and, and things that you've gone through in life because so many people go through that. That doesn't have to define you. That's not the definition of who you are. And it's never too late to start a new chapter. I think deep down I always, I've always loved storytelling. Uh, I'm a singer as well and I think that there's just such an art to storytelling through song and so I've always appreciated stories but I never took it seriously because I'm from Virginia and I try in life to not be dramatic you know and so it was always just like why are you crying over spilled milk like that's not who I am as a person I try to just see the whole perspective and then like make a better choice so I never related to the theater kids I thought like maybe I just don't get it like maybe I'm not artsy you know like maybe I'm just like not really an actor but I had an interest in it uh, my second year um, in college, I was at University of Virginia and I was walking around campus and they had these posters all over campus for open auditions for this like indie film that was called The Loss of Life. And so finally one day I was like, you know what, I'm gonna audition for that. I'm just gonna see if I could do it. And so I remember I went home to Roanoke, Virginia, two hours and I had an ex-boyfriend who for Christmas had given me a video camera. And so I pulled the video camera out, set it up on the tripod that he gave me. And I remember recording myself doing the lines and then I would watch it back because I knew nothing about acting. 
like nothing. And so I remember watching it back and being like, wow, that was horrible, right? And then I just kept recording it again, like I'm such a perfectionist that I recorded it and watched it back and recorded it and watched it back until I started to believe myself. And once I felt like I got to a place where I believed myself, I was like, Okay, so I like packed up my stuff. I drove back to University of Virginia and I went to the open call audition. And uh, after I walked in, I like fully committed to it. And when I walked out, like they literally just like canceled all the rest of the auditions. They were like, that's our girl. And I remember the next day I got the call that I had booked it. And I was like, oh God, what have I done? I got on set and I remember just completely falling in love with every single person. We're all just these artistic people that want to tell a story, but we're having fun on set. And when you call cut, you know, the drama's over. And so I just really fell in love with film and I was praying about it and I felt like that's what God wanted me to do. And so I remember calling Jason, who's my husband, who's my boyfriend at the time. And I was like, hey, I really feel like this is what God wants me to do. So if you think that we're gonna like last, I just need you to know right now that my plan is to move to Los Angeles after college graduation. So if you don't think you could ever live in LA, let's just be friends now. I don't wanna like mess this up. And he was just like, yeah, I think so. And then little did he know <laughs> what he got himself into. So that's how he got into it. We were doing background work and I, uh, I remember I got background work for Clint Eastwood in um, The Changeling, which was Angelina Jolie. There were like 2,000 girls there this one day and he picked me out of the crowd and he was like, you, I need your face. You have a 1920s face. Yeah. And so he, he taft heart lead me. He gave me like the three golden tickets that you needed. And so I was like a featured person. And then like, I had to cry with Angelina Jolie at, um, I was like a coworker of hers that cried and I didn't make it into the movie, but that's how I got into SAG. And I remember after that movie, even though it was just background, it was like right when I had moved, it was during the writer's strike. And I remember thinking, I just worked with Angelina Jolie and Clint Eastwood, I, I'm good. Flash forward to like 2011, the breakdown for the artist came out. And I remember I called up my agent at the time and I said, listen, Clint Eastwood told me I have a 1920s face. I love silent film. I just did a study on Clara Bow and Charlie Chaplin. No one knows the 1920s like I do, no one. And so she somehow got me an appointment by the grace of God. And the, the, Michelle Hazanavishi, the director, he wrote me into the movie. He and his beautiful, lovely wife, Bernice, and um, Jean Dujardin, who's the lead, they invited me to all the parties. Like, I'm like the only one without a resume, right? Like, I remember it was like a 150 person party. Like, every single person in the industry was there, and then me and my husband. And it was like, how did we get here? I don't know why I'm here. I remember just dying. And then Tony Bennett at this party flies in on a helicopter, goes down a ladder of the helicopter to the balcony. He is like as far from me as maybe 20 feet. And he's like, there's a piano and all that's between me and Tony Bennett is this piano. And I literally, I'm just like dead locked. I just like was like grabbing my husband like this. I remember I didn't take, and I literally just had tears streaming down my face. I was like, I just met Meryl Streep and Tony Bellinan just flew in on a helicopter and he is singing at me 20 feet away. He sings one song, he gets on the ladder and he leaves and that was like, and he just like, I was literally like, I called my mom that night and I was like, I could actually move home. Like if I never book anything else, I've accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish. You know, my favorite quote is actually by Mother Teresa. She says, do small things with great love. And I love that because I think that um, sometimes when you have a perspective that you really want to change the world, you have to remember that if anyone changed the world, you know, we could all agree that this nun from Italy who had no social media, who had no um, ambition of being famous, that was not her goal, everyone knows who she is. And she did change the world, but she says, do great things with, you know, small acts of kindness with great love and that's how you change the world. And so I think everything's a ripple effect. And I think that when we miss little moments in life, we're missing world changing events because you never know what a small act of kindness is gonna do.